to, it's 10 o'clock, and what we'll do is I'm going to give a little introduction, and then, Tom, I'll turn it over to you. All right, good. Okay, so good. So welcome, everybody, um, to our web uh, webinar on overboard prevention and recovery. And Captain Tom Tercy is our um, presenter this morning. And um, most of you know Tom, but I'll give you a little bit of an introduction. Um, Captain Tom Tercy holds a U.S. Coast Guard 100-ton Ocean Master's license. He is an ASA certified instructor and part owner of the Maryland School of Sailing. Tom teaches the navigation courses, and I uh, think several of you have taken a navigation course with Tom, both um, in the spring in the Philadelphia area, and also now we do an online full-length 107 coastal navigation Celestial. Course. Uh, I'm sorry, celestial navigation course. Uh, Tom also teaches our offshore courses, um, so you may have sailed with Tom to Bermuda or St. Thomas at one point, and he, uh, Tom also establishes school sailing programs and policy. Tom is also the author of many of our instructional texts, including two that have been adopted by ASA, and they are the Coastal Navigation and Piloting, which is used for the 105 course level, and the Docking Techniques book, which is used for the ASA 118 docking endorsement. Tom has been a lifelong sailor. He's owned a number of different race, racing and cruising sailboats and has completed over 50,000 miles of blue water ocean sailing throughout the world, in addition to extensive coastal cruising. And Tom will be talking today about overboard prevention and recovery, and I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Rita, and uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. And I'm looking out the window, and I do see snow coming down, so it's a, a good day not to be sailing. Uh, Gary, I hope that uh, the weather improves for you the next few days. As Rita said, um, the subject is overboard, crew overboard, prevention and recovery, and this is a subject which has been um, taught for many decades uh, through all the sailing schools, and there's pretty much of a conventional wisdom as to how this is done. And I, I've been thinking about this and watching what we've been doing for a number of years and uh, have come up with some somewhat different conclusions on some of the things we should focus on. Um, many of the methods that are used and taught are, on, are based on having really nice conditions out, nice sunny day, 10 knots of wind, moderate waves and so forth, good visibility. And that's not always the case. Uh, you might have uh, the unexpected. Like someone said, uh, expect the unexpected. So I just have my uh, cam video cam on for the moment, just so you know who's talking. And I'm going to turn that off so that you can see full screen what I'm going to be presenting to you. Um, so let's go to that. Um, as we've said, uh, this is the subject, Overboard Prevention and Recovery. And here's today's agenda that I plan to go through. It's going to be a pretty full-packed uh, two hours that we'll be covering because I do intend to cover some of the background and some of the older, uh, some of the existing techniques, some of the newer techniques that we, we've developed, and then also uh, some of the overboard equipment and uh, some, some ideas for staying on board the yacht in the first place uh, without going overboard. So uh, one of the primary concepts that I would like to get across to you today is that if someone goes overboard, stop the boat immediately. That's the, um, that's the main point I'd like to leave with you today. And the idea of that is that when you <clears throat> continue sailing or you have indecision and you don't know what to do next, you're getting further and further away from that victim who's in the water. And what we'd like to do is stay close to the victim so that if you have restricted visibility, if you have fog, I just communicated with a uh, captain who was doing some of these maneuvers, and they said that uh, it was foggy out. They could see no more than one-eighth of a mile. And um, 
they found that uh, using some of the uh, techniques that I'm recommending really helped uh, keeping them in close proximity and view of the uh, victim in the water. But um, here's some thoughts on distance. Uh, at six note, at six knots, as you see here, the boat's moving at 10 feet a second, and that's 100 feet after just 10 seconds. So if you have 10 seconds of indecision, you've gone 100 feet from the victim. And at, and at 100 feet away, the victim's head will appear 96% smaller than actual. 96% uh, smaller. So timing and quick action are essential. Now here's 96% smaller. You see there's this big circle. Here's, here's how the head looks to you up close. And here's how that head looks to you in the water at 100 feet away. It's um, vastly smaller, vastly harder to see. So as you start drawing away from the victim and you have some wave action, it's going to be very, very hard to, um, to find that victim in the water. Now think of someone going overboard under these conditions, and the question becomes, um, if you get further than 100 feet or so, are you going to be able to find them? Do you see them in this picture? Well, he's superimposed here about 100 feet away, and here's the head right here where my arrow is. So uh, you can see if you have any wave action at all, you see here in this picture visibility is good, but you have wave action. And the, um, the person in the water can very easily become lost in that wave action. So therefore the concept of um, not getting far from the victim, staying close to the victim. Recovery is unlikely, very low probability, when you have anything but the best conditions. If it's nighttime, fog, rain, strong winds, if the person is injured, if it, hypothermia starts setting in, all these things are going to um, add to the problems, the difficulty of recovering that person. So staying close is paramount in my mind. Um, this is not the time for somebody going overboard. Here we are sailing at night, pitch black, wind is blowing 18 knots, we're moving along at seven and a half to eight knots. Um, it takes the helmsman's great attention on steering the boat and keeping on course and keeping the sails full, keeping the boat properly moving. And someone goes over and think of what you would do in that condition. And if you um, go very far, you're going to lose them completely. So I'm going to go through um, first sailing recovery. This is what we have been teaching for years, uh, typical instructional procedures for going overboard recovery. And we're going to concentrate in this on the quick stop and jive maneuver and then also the figure eight maneuver. And there's some variations to the figure eight maneuver as well that we'll talk about on, uh, when we get to that. But this is recovery strictly under sail, under what, moderate conditions. So let's look at the first of these, the quick stop and jive maneuver. Now here's the um, boat is sailing along here at position number one. And you see we're close hauled. The wind is blowing in this picture from the top of the screen and uh, we're close hauled and someone goes over. Here's the man overboard. The point of the quick stop and jive maneuver is to immediately stop the boat by tacking and backing. The jib is now backed here. You've tacked through the wind, turned the boat essentially 90 degrees, and you, you've really arrested or stopped the forward momentum of the boat very, very quickly. And then you bear off and go on to a reach, beam reach, and then bear off further and turn down wind. And you ease the jib to slow the boat. Um, and when you then sail to below the victim, below in terms of the wind, you sail below the victim and turn up into a close reach luff both sails and hopefully bring the boat to a nice neat stop 
just um, just to win of the of the victim without running them over. And um, here's a picture of that last position. Here's the um, the MOB in the water. The victim is in the water right here where I'm pointing. Here's the bow of the boat. They're furling the jib. You see the jib sheets are whipping crazily here. And uh, you see also that the um, the mainsail is still full. Even though it's brought out here, it's still full of wind. So that can be adding to uh, to the motion. So this picture very closely represents what's shown in this diagram right here, where you're trying to bring the boat to a complete stop just to windward of the victim and uh, then effect a rescue. Uh, bring the boat, uh, bring the victim clo uh, along your beam and try to uh, rescue them over midship. So that is the quick stop and jive maneuver that we have classically taught for, uh, for many years. Okay? All right, the next maneuver, and this is taught uh, normally by ASA schools. It's part of the ASA textbook on uh, man overboard recovery, and I'd like to review it here. We have a similar situation where we're sailing here at, at position number one. Someone goes overboard, and you're close haul. Here again, the wind is blowing from the top of the screen. You're, um, you're close hauled, and in this case, instead of doing a quick stop where in that earlier diagram we turned the port to the left in this picture, in this case, we don't do that. We bear off, ease out the sails, sail downwind shortly, start heading up, and then tack the boat and bear off again, sail downwind again, ease the jib, start heading up, um, and come to a similar position as in that first diagram, you're going to come to a similar position as this, but you're you're doing it after you've done this this eight figure eight maneuver. Okay, now think about this. In order to complete this figure eight maneuver, you have to do about a dozen sail handling steps. Think of what you're doing here. Um, from this point, we're going to bear off and we're going to ease the main and the jib. There's two steps. We're going to uh, head off further and ease the main and jib further. Then we're going to start heading up and now we have to uh, sheet in the main and the jib. So there's two more steps. That's four. We're now going to come up here and tack and we're going to have to uh, tack the jib. So that's one more. That's five. Then we're going to head off again, and we're going to have to ease the main and the jib. There's two more steps, two more sail handling steps. That's seven. We're going to ha head off further, ease the main further, ease the jib, and begin to furl the jib. That's eight. And then we're going to head up, and we're going to... Um, ease both sails, complete furling the jib. So that you're now at about 10 sail handling maneuvers in order to complete this figure eight, in order to get to this spot. In the process, you've also sailed quite some distance. And um, if you're sailing a 40-foot boat, two and a half boat lengths is going to be 100 feet. So you can see by this diagram, if it's reasonably to scale, that you're going to be at least a couple of hundred feet away from that victim when you're when you're out uh, on the right edge of this out here. So the question is whether under conditions like this you would be able to maintain visual contact and actual um, appropriate uh, sail handling and maneuver in order to end up at that nice neat spot next to the victim. So these are some of the issues that I see with these two maneuvers. Um, they're fine. We teach them. 
They're good for, uh, in my view, they're good for um, conditions where you do not have an engine, and they're also good for conditions where uh, the weather is light, visibility is excellent, you have adequate um, crew members on board who can do all these sail handling maneuvers and do them efficiently. Uh, you have to have good judgment and uh, with your boat speed and with your distances and, and your direction relative to the victim and the, and the wind in order to end up at the right spot. So it takes, it takes considerable skill and practice uh, in my mind to, um, to be able to do this accurately and, and, and efficiently and not lose sight of the victim. So, and, and always keep in mind uh, conditions like this. So um, this sailing recovery that we've just been through, as I mentioned, the advantage is an engine is not required. Uh, the disadvantage is that it requires sailing away from the, from the victim in order to gain maneuvering speed and room. And, and keep in mind that you also, under these conditions, if you have not built up enough speed, you could end up going into irons here where you're trying to tack. And if there's any wave action at all running, there's a good chance of going into irons and not making the tack. And then you have to more or less start all over again with this maneuver. So um, it requires sailing enough distance in order to get maneuvering speed and room to make the maneuvers. You could lose sight of the victim. As I mentioned, considerable skill is required um, and practice. And here's a very vital one. It's difficult for a single remaining crew member. What if you had just two people on the boat and one went overboard and the one person remaining on board has to go through this 10 or 12 sail handling maneuvers in order to complete this loop. And if it's blowing 15 or 18 knots and you're on a 40-foot boat, what is the likelihood that the one single remaining person on board could successfully complete that dozen sail handling maneuvers and successfully get back to the victim without losing sight of them? And while you're doing sail handling maneuvers, your, your, your attention, your vision is not going to be on the person in the water. It's going to be on what you're doing with sail handling. So I see, I see this particular item here as being an extremely um, weak uh, point of doing these, um, these uh, strictly sail handling maneuvers. If you have no engine, you have no choice. You must do it by sail. Um, but keep these things in mind, please. Okay, so sailing recovery, um, further discussion on that. There were MOBC trials conducted in 2005 on San Francisco Bay uh, with a number of sail and power boats. And there is a published report on, on those trials um, written by John Rumenier. Um, and it's available either through the Boat US website or you can get ac a link access to it on the Maryland School Store website, item number 56. This is a link to that report. And in that report, they go through, they, they went through with live um, victims going into the water. They had wetsuits and snorkels and everything. And uh, San Francisco Bay, lots of wind or no, moderate wind, I would say, from the photos. And um, it uh, goes into uh, um, all the different maneuvers they did, the different things that different boats tried. They had 20 or so boats in this doing various maneuvers. So it's, it's very interesting reading. And it's all on the sailing recovery. They also had power boats, strictly power boats, but um, I didn't focus uh, actually, the report doesn't focus a great deal on the power boats, but uh, there's a lot of focus on these on the sailboats. So, item number 56 on the school, on our school store website. Okay, the next thing I'd like to talk about. Excuse me a second. The next thing I'd like to talk about is motor sailing recovery. Up to this point, we've talked about sailing recovery strictly under sail. Now I'd like to talk about some of the concepts for motor sailing recovery 
that can be applicable to these unfriendly conditions of heavy weather, large waves, darkness, limited viz, fog, rain, or with only one crew member remaining on board. And this is what these next set of maneuvers focuses on. So the concepts, the objectives of these motor sailing recovers is number one, stay close to the victim and remain sight in sight of the victim. And also to minimize helmsman indecision. Excuse me, that's my telephone ringing. <laughs> Okay, it minimizes helmsman indecision because there's, only, there's going to be only one standard instruction to the helmsman, which you'll see as we go through the diagrams for this. And it can be used in a wide range of weather and vis conditions. It can also be used from all points of sail. For instance, what if you're not close hauled when someone goes over? What if you're on a broad reach? Or what if you're sailing wing on wing with a, a pulled out Genoa? What do you do then? So these um, maneuvers will go through that with you. Uh, in other words, what I'm saying is unfriendly weather and sea conditions and also non-standard uh, sailing condition configurations. That is not, not close hauled. Um, and it gets you, these get you to a reliable, what I call rescue spot for MOB recovery. And the concept of a rescue spot is Know the maneuvers that you need to do to get there. Someone goes over. No discussion. No decisions. Get there immediately. Okay? And here's what I define as a rescue spot. The boat is one to two boat lengths to windward of the victim. Beam to the victim. Upwind. You're in visual contact. And I find this to be the best position to, to make a rational decision on how I'm now going to get that person on board. But the key is I've gotten to that position uh, by some fairly simple maneuvers, and I've stayed in visual contact with the MOB, and there was not a great deal of sail handling to get there, okay? And I don't lose sight of them. Um, in the process. Um, in this position, the boat will be tend to blow towards the victim. A heaving line, if you throw it, will tend to blow towards the victim. And other rescue maneuvers that we'll talk, or rescue uh, devices that we'll talk about will also uh, be beneficial or will be workable in this condition. So this is the rescue spot, two, one to two boat lengths to windward of the, of the MOB. Now, you can hold the rescue spot upwind of the MOB with luff sails and the engine alternately in reverse and forward as necessary to remain upwind of the MOB. Because if you do nothing, the boat's going to start heading off and downwind. You also want to furl the jib to stop the bow from turning down. And um, as I mentioned before, the, a heaving line will carry with the wind or a tethered dinghy or a tethered swimmer can more easily get to the MOB from this rescue spot. Okay, how do we get to the rescue spot? Well, I have four maneuvers shown here. One is from close hauled or close reaching. Number two is from beam reaching. Number three from broad reaching with Genoa or cruising chute. Um, and the fourth is downwind with a pulled out Genoa. So let's go through these maneuvers and um, see the feasibility of getting to that rescue spot. So this first issue, the set of issues we're going to talk about is how to get to the rescue spot. Later, we'll talk about how to recover from the rescue spot. Okay. So let's do number one, close hauled or close reaching when crew member goes overboard. Here we are sailing close hauled. Uh, blown about 12 knots, boat's cranking along about 7 knots, uh, sails are trimmed in uh, for this uh, point of sail, and someone goes over. What do you do? Okay, so here, here's the sequence. Uh, punch, uh, my, my focus on it is, and this doesn't agree with everyone, but 
my immediate number one thing is I would punch the GPS MOB button because that gives me uh, what may happen subsequently. Things may not work exactly as you want them to, and if I have if I have noted that on the GPS where that person is in the water, I have a much better chance of coming back and picking them up later. So I always say punch the GPS and then immediately turn the windward and tack the boat. Do not release the jib. In other words, you're going to tack and back the jib. The boat is now basically hove to. Also immediately shout man overboard. When another crew member gets on deck, assign a spotter. John, you, you keep an eye on the, on the victim. Deploy the horseshoe pole and strobe so that there's uh, something visual to contact. And also the horseshoe is a, um, is a life preserver. Uh, check lines overboard and start the engine. One of the things you don't want to do is foul the prop. So make sure you take two seconds and check for lines overboard before you start the engine. Maneuver to the rescue spot, upwind of the MOB, and then at that point make recovery decisions. But you're now in visual contact with the MOB. If you're sailing close hauled, they go over, you immediately tack the boat, you luff the sails, you start the engine, here you are, you're in close visual contact to the person in the water. And from this point, from this rescue spot, you now make a decision as to how I'm going to recover. Um, they, may, they may be injured, they may be unconscious you might have to immediately put a, a rescue swimmer in the water. You might have to launch the dinghy with a tethered dinghy. Um, you have to decide at that point what to do based on the condition. The, the, the victim looks like they're um, in good shape. They're, they're waving to you. They're, ta they're, they're hollering. Uh, here I am. Here I am. Uh, you, you throw a heaving line, and uh, you, you, um, at this point they're close enough that um, – the heaving line should reach, carries with the wind, and um, you drag them in towards the boat. So the key here is you very, very quickly got to this rescue spot with one simple maneuver, and the boat has stopped, and it's now easier to keep in visual contact with the victim. Okay, so that's maneuver number one. Here's maneuver number two, your beam reaching when crew member goes overboard. Now, this is going to be very similar to number one, and uh, here we are, this uh, crew member was up here putting up the uh, Q flag before we entered Bermuda, and all of a sudden he slipped and went overboard, and uh, what do you do? Procedure is very, very similar. Punch the GPS MOB button, immediately turn to windward, tack the boat, so you're tacking and backing again. All of this is, is almost precise, is precisely the same. The only difference here is that you you may have to more aggressively use the engine, but in both cases you're turn it on, turning the engine on when you tack and back. But you're, you may have to more aggressively use the engine in order to make it through the wind and the wave conditions, depending on what the wave conditions are. And here's the maneuver. Uh, here's the wind here. You're sailing along on a beam reach. Someone goes over. You start heading up, or you, you, you basically, I don't want to say start heading up, you tack the boat. You, you go hard over. You may not make it through the tack, but the engine is going to help power you through the tack if needed. And you come back to the same basic rescue spot. And you have, you're facing the same conditions of um, how do I rescue from this point. The third maneuver is broad reaching with Genoa or cruising chute when crew member goes over. And here we are with a cruising chute up. You notice we have the mainsail uh, reef to allow more wind into the cruising chute, and we're sailing on a, an apparent wind angle of about 120 degrees or thereabouts. And um, you have this big cruising chute to deal with, and what do you do when someone goes over? You do the exact same thing. You're going to punch the GPS MOB button, immediately turn to windward and tack the boat. Now, do not release the head sail. The chute will likely be damaged, but there's a life at stake. 
and we're going to not worry about damaging the cruising chute when we want to rescue somebody in the water. So the, the, the cruising chute is going to be backed against the rigging, the, the head stay, the, the inner stay, the mast, all of this sort of a thing. It's going to be getting beat up and quite possibly ripped. Uh, you're going to do still the same basic maneuvers here. You started the engine, and very, very likely you're going to have to power through um, the rest of that tack to get to the rescue spot. But you end up, again, at the same basic position at the rescue spot. Here we were, position number one, brought off. Here's the Genoa or the cruising chute out. The mainsail has a preventer on it. You see this dash, dash line here. If you're sailing off the wind, you should always have a preventer on your mainsail boom. And it's prevented in this manner from, from jibing. And you do the same thing. You, you, you head up immediately. You turn up into the wind. You're starting the engine. You power through. You now have the sails backed and this Jib, it's either the jib or the or the cruising chute that's shown here, uh, being backed against the rigging. The mainsail, you notice the preventer is still on. Here's the preventer tied on starboard side. The mainsail boom is still held over to starboard, but it's backed in this case. Okay, and as you come over, you're now going to ease um, ease the cruising ease the chute or the um, the jib, uh, try to douse the jib, uh, but in any event, you've ended up at this position, rescue spot to windward of the MOB. Okay, so so that's the third maneuver. And the fourth maneuver, you're running wing on wing with a pulled out Genoa when the crew member goes over. And um, here we are sailing, pulled out Genoa. Here we are on starboard tack. Wind is blowing off our starboard quarter. The main sail is full out on the, on the port side of the boat. There is a preventer line on it. And the, the jib is pulled out. And you notice that the, um, the pole, I'll show you in the next diagram how we have the pole rigged, how it should properly be rigged. Um, and the downwind equipment that we're using, as shown in that in that picture, one is a boom preventer, and the other is a whisker pole. And let's look at first off the preventer. Here's what's going to happen if I am on, um, in this case, uh, starboard tack, and here is the boom out to port, and here's the preventer on holding that boom out. And here's the main sheet snugged in tight so that I have a, um, a triangular structure, if you will. I have the boom. I have this um, preventer, which really leads forward from the boom to either the midship cleat or the bow cleat, either one. And you have the, the main sheet holding the boom uh, taut here, and the whole system is fairly rigid, and that's how we're sailing with the, uh, the prevented boom. And when we jibe, we, the boom is going to partly move in, because the wind is now in back of the mainsail from this direction. The, move, the, the boom is going to try to flop over and jibe, but the preventer is preventing it from doing so. And it's going to come into roughly midship or a little less than midship. The the jib or the um, um, main sheet is going to be slack at this point. Okay, and that's what happens with the boom and the boom preventer when you when you uh, do a jibe. Now <clears throat> the whisker pole, which was shown in that previous photograph is rigged, here's, here's the pole for the Genoa, and here are these green lines, a fore guy and an after guy. Here's the fore guy going up to the bow. Here's an after guy coming to midship. Here's a topping lift, the blue line, 
which is holding the end of the pole up. So these three lines are holding this pole rigid, and here's the fitting that's on the end of that pole. So it has this eye here for these two green lines, the two, the two um, guy lines, four guy and after guy, and it has this eye for the topping lift, and it has this plunger, which allows you to put the, main, the uh, jib sheet into it, into this hole, and the jib sheet actually slides through that hole. You don't some people take the um, whisker pole and actually attach it to the clue of the sail, which is wrong. You should actually uh, use this kind of a fitting and allow the, um, the uh, jib sheet to slide through this. Because in this con configuration, you can actually furl or unfurl the jib without doing anything with the pole. So... Um, You'll see in our diagrams how how that will be a benefit to you. So, with that in mind, when you're sailing wing on wing, pulled out Genoa, prevented boom, uh, you're going to do again the the same thing. Except instead of tacking and backing, you're going to you're going to immediately do a down a downwind jibe. All right, and the rest of these maneuvers are similar. You're going to, steps are similar. You're going to start the engine to power through the wind. So let's look at this in diagram form. Here we are at diagram number one. Uh, we have the pulled out Genoa. We have the boom, the green, with a preventer on it, and we're sailing wing on wing. Here's the wind up here. Someone goes over. You're you're getting. You're sailing away from them very, very rapidly at this point, and 100 feet will be accomplished very shortly. So we immediately jibe, and we're turning left in this case. And you see the boom is trying to flop over, but the preventer prevents it from flopping fully over, okay, as shown in this diagram. All right, and we start the engine. We power up, power through the tack. The jib is now going to be backed on the pole, but the point is I can easily furl that if I'm rigged properly this way. I don't have to do anything at all with the pole. I can just furl in the jib, and I get again to the rescue spot uh, very promptly. I've done nothing with the mainsail. It jibed. It jibed back again uh, when I come to this point. Uh, in this configuration, it's probably luffing. But I have no jib up. I, I, I've dealt with that. So, so those are the four basic maneuvers that I recommend um, for these uh, unfriendly conditions that you may encounter. So now you're at the rescue spot from whichever point of sail you started from, whether it's close haul, reaching, or broad off, um, or running downwind. Uh, you now have visibility on the victim. You're not far from them, and you're now uh, ready to make a decision on how to recover the victim. Now we're going to go on to recovery from the rescue spot. The, all these maneuvers up to this point were to get you to that spot, one or two boat lens to windward of the MOB, and um, in, in, in full view of the MOB, what do we do now? So the recovery decisions we have deal with um, do, do we recover directly from this rescue spot or do we go around under sail or under power? We may decide to do that. Um, and in this, we have to consider various aspects. One, how close are they? Are they injured? Are they coherent? What are the wind wave conditions? What is the visibility? Um, and what about the crew skills remaining on board um, at this point? So these are things. That, but the point is that you've got 30 seconds to make a decision, a rational decision on how we're going to proceed with this recovery. And it may be as simple as throwing throwing a rescue a uh, heaving line. So the recovery essentials, as I see it, are first first you want to connect the line to the MOB. 
and that can be either a, hanging, a, a heaving line, a tethered dinghy, a tethered swimmer. If these things are unsuccessful, you may decide to encircle the MOB with a life sling. And um, the life sling is a very effective device uh, that every boat should have on board. And uh, I'll show you a little bit about this as, as we proceed. And of course, in all of this, we don't want to foul the prop. We have to always be conscious of the possibility of lines being overboard in, uh, in this panic emergency situation. And you might foul the prop, and um, you have a serious consider situation at this point. Once you connect a line to the MOB, you want to haul them to midship and bring them aboard. Get them aboard quickly and, of course, administer first aid as necessary. Now, let's look at recovery equipment and procedures. Uh, I mentioned heaving line, tethered dinghy, tethered swimmer, life sling, lifting MOB, and an injured MOB. These things we want to talk about. So first off, just heaving lines. Uh, here is on the left of this diagram is a rope in a bag. This is a rope about 75 feet long. Uh, it's flaked in the bag in such a way that when you heave the bag, you see the bag has a handle on it. You put this um, loop of this uh, heaving line on your off-hand wrist. So if you're right-handed, put it on your left, hand, left wrist and then heave it uh, underhanded um, with a lot of gusto in order to heave it past the MOB. You're not trying to hit the MOB with the orange bag. You're trying to heave it past them so that the line falls on them and the bag actually lands beyond them if, if that's feasible. And, um, but that's the objective here. And then you can also use a life ring with a line attached. A life ring can be thrown further um, and probably with a bit more accuracy than the rope in the bag. Uh, but in either event, you have heaving lines of some sort that you can heave towards that person. If they're able and they're coherent, uh, they can grab these, you can pull them to midship, and you can affect your recovery from that point. So heaving lines is the first issue. The next issue, and it's going to take longer, but if that MOB is injured or incoherent, you may decide to put out a, a tethered dinghy, and uh, you have a, a crew member in the dinghy, and um, in that case, uh, I would have a paddle with me, and certainly you want to maneuver towards the dinghy, but the point is you don't want to get disconnected from the mothership. You want to stay connected. Uh, and you might ask the question, well, what if there are only two people sailing and I had just one remaining on board? Would I get off into the dinghy and have us, two of us out in the water there, nobody on the ship? Well, that's a decision you'd have to make at that time. Uh, but it's a, it's a serious consideration. Um, the other Oh, and the other one that I mentioned to you was uh, a tethered swimmer, and this is similar to the dinghy, except it's quicker than uh, the time it takes to launch a dinghy. But if you have an unable, a disabled victim in the water who may be unconscious or incoherent, you may have no choice but to do one of these things. Uh, the other thing is that you can attempt to maneuver closer with mothership and uh, and get to that MOB. And to that end, we have the life sling, which can you can take, at this point, you can take all sails down and go on engine power and put the life sling out. And the life sling is basically a harness. It's cleated to the boat. And you uh, drive the boat in a circle around the MOB, the victim, and uh, you attempt to drag that line across them. There's one um, deficiency that I see in the design of the life sling, the standard life sling, and that is that it's often hard to get this line as you're going in this circle. It's hard to get this line to cross over the MOB. 
as you come in the circle and you're dragging it, this uh, harness is so light and it floats. There's very little drag on it. And as you circle around, it often, um, by the time you get the line close, the, the harness has passed them. So you keep kind of going around in a circle. Unless you're an experienced um, water ski boat driver, there are maneuvers that you can use that can avoid this. But the solution to it can be very simply to have a small parachute drogue attached to that life sling harness to give it some drag so that when you, when you do this maneuver coming around, the, this line is more apt to drag across that victim as opposed to pulling past them. Okay, now, so those, those are just some of the concepts for um, getting connected with the MOB who's, who's in the water. Um, the next ideas I'd like to talk about briefly are uh, lifting the MOB. And um, midship, I believe, is preferred as opposed to uh, lifting over the stern because lifting over the stern uh, has some hazards, which I'll show you a diagram uh, related to that. And I also believe use of the main halyard, the mainsail halyard, is uh, the best way to lift the person as opposed to use of a tackle. And I'll show you some of my thoughts on that as well. Uh, and if you have an injured MOB, uh, you can use a canvas sling, which I'll show you, or the dinghy or the swimmer for assistance. So, so these are some of the things I'd like to go through in talking about bringing the MOB aboard. The first thing on, if you're trying to recover on the stern, uh, as waves go by, the boat's going to, to pitch up and down, up and down. And if you have more than a two-foot, maybe a three-foot um, wave set running, uh, there's a very good chance that you could hit the person on the head with the stern of the boat before you bring them aboard. Yes, in uh, nice calm conditions with uh, no waves running and uh, it's no more than going swimming overboard, you come up the stern ladder fine. But the, the point is, keep this in mind, that if there's any wave action at all and this boat is going up and down, this is a very hazardous situation. If you're at midship bringing aboard, the boat is got, still pitching wildly in, that, in those waves, but the center of the boat is relatively stable um, where, where you're trying to bring the MOB aboard. So um, now the next concept is lifting with the main halyard. Uh, in my view, it's direct and simple. Uh, this, if you have a, a halyard winch here, uh, on the um, on the boom on the mast, it's likely to be let's say on a 40 foot boat, it's likely to be at least 20 to one uh, mechanical advantage. If I have this halyard led back to the cockpit, I can put it on a winch there, and you might have uh, 30 to one mechanical advantage. Uh, it's become in vogue to use a tackle, um, which I think presents its own issues. A tackle, um, first of all, has to be rigged, takes time to rig it, and it has to be rigged properly in order to, um, to uh, have it work with you. First off, it has to be raised high enough here so that when you lift this MOB out of the water, you have enough distance in the tackle to lift them over the lifelines. And, um, Secondly, the tackle, a tackle like this has a four to one purchase. And um, it seems to me a poor choice to use a four to one purchase tackle when you have, let's say, a 30 to one um, mechanical advantage winch. So um, I, I think that the uh, tackle, quite frankly, is a very poor choice. A lot of people say, well, um, I'd like to have a tackle so that if I have only one person on board and they're unable to to handle a, um, a Genoa winch, let's say um, 
this main, I meant a main halyard winch coming back to the cockpit. If you're handling it back here, they cannot handle this winch at the same time as they, um, as they help maneuver the person over the lifelines. Well, my answer to that is, if that's the case, if you're going to be sailing with two people, I recommend that you have um, a, a good sturdy uh, halyard winch on the mast so that you can do the work from here as opposed to having to lead it back to the cockpit and, and thereby eliminate the need for using this tackle. Obviously, if you don't have a spare halyard available, you could use a boom topping lift with a four-part tackle. In that case, you might have the boom out here, have the boom topping lift holding that boom, swing the boom over the side with a tackle attached and lift them with them that way. But um, here's a picture of people using a tackle. This was on San Francisco Bay in those um, trials that I told you about. And here they are lifting this MOB. And just from the uh, expressions and the body positions of these rescuers, does it look like they're having an easy time? To me, it looks like they're having a very difficult time doing this. This fellow with the red jacket, he's hauling on this tackle. Now, this tackle is, in my view, improperly rigged uh, because as he pulls to raise the victim, he's pulling the whole rig back. Whereas if you do have a tackle and it's rigged this way with a turning block here, then as you pull on this, you're not pulling this whole rig back to the stern of the boat. It's staying at midship, okay, and you're pulling up on it. He's pulling down on it and pulling the rig back, and you've got two other people trying to help this poor guy up over. Plus, I question whether they have enough vertical room here to clear this six-foot fella over the lifelines. So as you can see, this is not, does not look like an easy procedure. Um, However you, however you measure it. Um, but that's with use of a tackle. My opinion, I'd like to keep it simple with the halyard and if need be, get the proper winches with the proper mechanical advantage to do the job. And I think you're, I think you're miles ahead with that. Okay, lifting tackle, I've mentioned these things. Benefits, no main halyard available or no mass mounted winch available. And the disadvantages, rigging, lifting tackle is complicated, time-consuming in a time of panic, and the tackle has small mechanical advantage as compared with the halyard winch. Okay, um, now an injured MOB, injured person. Many sling slings and rigs are commercially available. All assume MOB is unable to help. Most require a swimmer to enter the water and get the MOB into a sling and refer to that report that I, that I told you about before, number 56 on our school store. You'll see that report. And it talks about um, lifting MOB, injured MOBs, and it also talks about different commercial products that are available. And um, I have a suggestion for a simple rig, and it's shown here. And basically, it is a, um, a canvas stretcher if you will, only it needs to be wide enough so that it will encircle the, the victim in the water. Now, the concept is that I would take this, um, this can be collapsed. It's basically a canvas, maybe, maybe four and a half feet wide, and it has two sewn-in tunnels in this canvas, and I have two poles and I have this, this, um, these lines on it. And what I do, this is a hook on this side, okay? And what I do is I put this thimble on the main halyard. I drop the whole rig vertically, and I drop it deep enough so that a, a swimmer in the water can maneuver this injured person who's laying essentially horizontal in the water, although maybe not completely, but essentially horizontal. And I, and I attempt to 
maneuver this uh, stretcher, this canvas, under them, bring this hook end up and hook it here, and then I have essentially this this affair. And um, and I lift with the halyard, and this is this is shallow enough so that I should be able to lift clear the lifelines reasonably well. This is something that you would have to make and you'd have to practice with, obviously. Uh, but this is my recommendation for a, a, a simple lifting sling. Uh, after recovery, we of course have vital signs. We have to look for injuries, hypothermia, medical advisory services, which you can uh, have, as we have on board, a, um, a medical advisory service that we can contact via uh, radio for uh, step-by-step uh, procedures if needed. And by the way, while I'm mentioning this, uh, Captain Lee Tucker, who I believe is here today, is going to be giving a, um, a, uh, a medical preparedness seminar in about a month. I don't know that we have a precise date for that yet, but in about a month we expect to do that. Um, so I'd like to just mention briefly maneuvers under power only. There's a series of these maneuvers, round turn, racetrack turn, Williamson turns, and search patterns. And these are all well established and documented elsewhere. I'm not going to spend any time on them during this seminar. Um, but I wanted to just acknowledge that they exist. And you can research these further. In fact, if you Google any of these terms, uh, you should be able to find quite a bit of information on the, on the Internet about these now. Um, I'd like to talk next about overboard equipment. That is uh, some of the things that we need to have um, if you go into the water and to help with your survivability. And that includes flotation, strobe light, whistle, and so forth. I'm going to talk about each of these items now in sequence. So first off, uh, there's the um, a simple uh, horseshoe pole, horseshoe pole and strobe combination. And this is the way we rig it on our cruises. Uh, you may add uh, a drogue chute on it. We don't put the drogue on it, but you may put one on. You, you can also have a whistle on it. But basically, we have these rigged in such a way that they can be rapidly deployed. And in those earlier maneuvers where I had the list of actions, emergency actions, one of the items was deploy horseshoe, pole, and strobe. And this is the rig that I'm talking about in, in those. Okay. Um, the purpose of this is that it provides flotation. Uh, it provides something for the MOB to swim towards if they're able. It provides a, a, an elevated visual contact, the flag up here, for both the person in the water and for the crew on the boat. Uh, Switlick makes a, a MOM, a MOM module, that they um, can be deployed by uh, just pulling a lanyard, and there's a charge inside this box, and it blows it out into the air, and everything expands. And before you know it, you have a... Um, uh, either a, a horseshoe, an inflated horseshoe, and a, and a pole, uh, or you have, uh, in a more advanced version of the MOM, you actually have a little life raft and, um, and a pole. But these are all inflatable items that are packed inside this, and I believe Captain uh, Eric Peterson, who's here, um, has had this on his boat when he was doing a transatlantic trip. Uh, I think he had to mom th this first one. Uh, the The advantage of this over this is that uh, this has to be repacked once it's used. And if it was used or accidentally deployed, uh, you you wouldn't have the services of it. But uh, you can always um, recover this and put it back on board and have it ready for service. Okay, the flotation vest, there are various kinds. There's a, um, the, uh, this is uh, either a type 2 or a type 1 flotation vest. Uh, this, what's shown here is an offshore vest. Uh, this is a solid vest. It's not inflatable. 
you have an inflatable horseshoe collar, which inflates with a CO2 charge, uh, or you have a, um, a lightweight vest. This is a Stormy Seas vest, uh, which includes a bladder, and it's uh, inflatable also. This, this one is simply more comfortable to wear than either of these. The disadvantage of this is that it has less pounds of flotation, and it does not have a head support. So if the victim was unconscious uh, and using this, they would not have the head support that these two vests provide. Okay. Personal strobe lights, there are again all sorts of versions of personal strobe lights that are available. You can again go and Google or go to West Marine and see all the various options that are available. But you certainly want to have a personal strobe light uh, because even in the daytime, a personal strobe can be seen, even in bright sunlight. Um, now, I call this the wrong strobe, and I see many people uh, sailing with these, and I'd like to um, pose a question as to why do you think I might call this a wrong strobe? This has, on the top end, a strobe light. In here, it has a flashlight. And um, I know that a lot of people use these, but I consider it to be the wrong thing to use. Now. Um, I'm going to ask you at the end of the discussion to, if you have any thoughts on why this might be uh, inadvisable, uh, give me your opinions on that, and I'll tell you my opinions on it. Okay, uh, whistle. You want to have an audible whistle of some sort uh, with you in the water, and that should be part of your own personal gear. Um, a dye marker is a good thing to have. And this, again, can be um, deployed in the water and put a big orange circle in the water for um, in the daylight uh, for your crew members to see, um, your rescuers to see. Um, a flashlight. Uh, there are all sorts of flashlights. And um, uh, I personally uh, prefer the, um, the mag lights just because they're very rugged and durable, uh, very waterproof. And they also now have them with uh, uh, bright, uh, lights, um, not just an incandescent light, but they also have them with the, um, I'm going to forget the term, the real bright lights. Okay, um, tools, you ought to have on your person some kind of a tool. You just never know when you need to grip something or, or, or do something. You can have the Leatherman, which has, you know, a toolkit in a in one or a vice grips, which I find very effective. Captain Jack Morton, who Jim Barber, you're going to be sailing. No, not Jim. Uh, Captain Jack Morton, one of our ocean skippers, always has a pair of small vice grips on his person. He finds them more effective than the pliers, but the pliers are pretty good too. So some sort of a tool you ought to have with you. There are overboard alarms, and these alarms. Um, when you when someone goes overboard and has this device on their person, it trips an alarm on board, so that crew members on board are alerted to the fact that somebody went overboard. Like, what if you have only one person on watch, um, and you're sailing along at night, and other people are sleeping, and you go overboard? Well, this is going to set off an alarm in the boat to alert uh, other crew members. Uh, there's also personal locator beacons, and there's a whole range of these available now, but it's a satellite-based, uh, GPS-based system in which you can have a, a device on your person um, which can track your position. It can send a signal back to your boat. It can also send a signal to the rescue, to the rescue people. And um, this is uh, another thing, again, Search the web, and you Google these things, and you'll find uh, lots of information on lots of different ones that are available. Uh, you can Google Man Overboard Rescue, and you'll see many, many choices available. OK, next thing I'd like to focus on is uh, staying on board in the first place. Uh, I'd like to not go overboard. And these are some of the um, concepts that I'd like to talk about briefly. Uh, good jack lines, harness and tether, good handholds, good lifelines, deck shoes, trip hazards. Uh, going forward, 
and the procedures for that, watch the crew going forward, communication between people, deck light, deck floodlights, crawl as needed, enforce your procedures. So let's talk about some of these things briefly. Here we are sailing along uh, at seven and a half knots or so, close hauled, and um, here is shown this yellow line here is a jack line. It's a piece of flat webbing, goes all the way from the bow of the boat to the stern of the boat, and it can be reached uh, uh, from the cockpit, clip on before you go forward. Now it looks like this, this is a preventer line by the way, here's this blue line. Uh, it just happened to be here even though we're close hauled, it was never de-rigged in this picture. But you can actually reach under that and clip onto this so that you're not getting, getting tangled up with this blue line. But the jack line should be full length of the boat on the side dock side decks or center line. Some people rig them on the center line of the boat, but I think it's hard to get full length of the boat on center line. They should be webbing and some use wire rope instead of webbing. And basically these red lines here show the configuration uh, that we would normally use all the way from the bow to the stern of the boat to allow you full length access without detaching. In other words, if I'm going forward while I'm still in the cockpit, I hook onto this uh, jack line and go all the way forward. And um, you can bring this way up to some fixture on the bow and way back to some fixture astern and tie it tight. And um, in addition to those side decks, we always rig a cockpit jack line that's um, the full length of the cockpit and can also be reached from the companionway before you come up on deck. You can actually hook on to that jack line. Um, harnesses, harnesses and tethers. Here's a Lareka's harness, which um, you see is a pretty simple harness, can be put on easily. It has the tether permanently attached to, to the harness and it has a spring-loaded hook here on this end that you can clip to the lifeline to the uh, jack line. This is a, a Mustang body harness, very similar to the one I just showed you, the Lorecos. It has two D rings, and uh, you can and attach your um, your uh, tether to that. Now, talk about tethers. Uh, a lot of people use a tether with hooks in both ends. And you'll see this kind of a tether where it has this quick disconnect hook with these this little um, lanyard on it as shown in this this diagram this picture here so that he can quickly disconnect. I personally think this is the wrong tether and I know that everybody uses them or almost everybody except me and a couple of people I know. Um, I've seen these disconnect accidentally. I've seen people um, uh, coming up the companionway, leaning over, accidentally stepping on, this, on these red balls and disconnecting it. So I say to myself, it can happen that easily. It can happen when I don't want it to happen at the wrong time. I have to ask the question, what is the purpose of the harness and tether? is to keep me attached to the boat. So why do I want to put a weak link into that system and have an accidental disconnection? Where people say, well, if the boat sinks, I can rapidly disconnect from the boat. And I have to ask the question of, well, all right, we're talking about now relative probabilities. I have two possibilities that can occur here. One, I can have this tether and it can accidentally disconnect when I don't want it to, or the boat can, or I have the other tether, and the boat sinks and drags me under. And you have to answer the question for yourself: Which probability do you, th do you think is greater? Um, the boat sinking and dragging me under before I can disconnect, or me accidentally disconnecting this thing? when I don't want it to. There's no right answer to the question. My answer for myself is I'm going to stay attached to the boat 
if the boat decides to sink in, in 32 seconds, well, I guess it's going to drag me down. But I think that that probability is very low because if the boat is going to sink, it's probably not going to sink that quickly. Having said that, I realize that in the race, um, there were there were uh, there was a race up in um, the Great Lakes, the Mack race, where this boat went over very very quickly, and people were tethered in, and two people died. They were still tethered to the boat. The boat had turned turtle, and um, but. The coroner said those two people died from head trauma. What actually happened is the boat turned over so rapidly that they both got banged on the head and they died from the head trauma. The second instance is there was a race over um, near Ireland where this uh, boat, um, I'm trying to remember the name of it, began with an R, I can't remember the name of it. Um, went over very quickly in three seconds because they if this was a high this is a maxi racer, a hundred foot maxi racer, they lost the bulb on the end of their keel. And the boat in fact did turn turtle in three seconds. And um so that was that was one instance where it, it went over in three seconds. It didn't sink. The boat stayed floating upside down in that case. But uh, anyway, this is a long story. Um you have to make your own decision on the type tether. My recommendation is stay attached to the boat with this type tether. Okay. So a crew member going overboard is very serious business with a high possibility of loss of life. There's a lot of things to think about I've presented to you. Planning, preparation, and practice are essential preventive measures. Know your boat, your crew skills where the emergency equipment is stored, know how to use it, and practice, practice, practice. So thank you for participating.